Almighty God, we come to you this morning as people from all backgrounds. We ask your sweet and powerful Holy Spirit to dispense upon us that we may encounter a renewed sense of our faith, that we would be attentive to the workings in and around us as a people who follow the risen Christ. We are grateful today for what we know is only through the influence of your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we can encounter your word. So God, we ask that you would revive us again. Revive as you have revived your children and people time and time again. Now, Almighty God, I ask that you would speak through me as your vessel, that the words from my mouth and the meditations from all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. There are times in our lives when it becomes pretty apparent that God is interested in doing a new thing within us. It can coincide with the changing of the seasons or the changing of the year or the changing of a physical location or change in circumstance in our lives. One thing is for sure that God is always interested in moving each of us into a deeper relationship, a more meaningful relationship with God's self. And for me... Each of us are called, I feel, to be every day joining in that deeper relationship with Christ. And from time to time, when perhaps we find ourselves in the dull moments of life, maybe we feel like we're stuck or just going through the motions, it's at that time, at that certain circumstance, where we need renewal. And not just any renewal, but a renewal with our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we have been, the past several weeks, speaking of this kind of renewal. The renewal, a reminder of our purpose and promise as children of God. Spiritual renewal as we learn through the story of the feeding of the 5,000. A renewal that surpassed the wants of the disciples and afforded them what they truly need. The witness of a miracle. Last Sunday, we encountered the prophet Elijah in the desert on the verge of despair and depression. We saw his need for emotional renewal. And in turn, how God always provides our every need, even amidst our emotions of fear, anxiety, angst. We learned that God walks with us through those stormy waters in order to provide the emotional renewal of our faith. In my experience, God's renewal is as much for our physical being as it is for our inner being. You see, Christianity is a physical faith. I'll say that again. Christianity is a physical faith. James 2 tells us that faith without works is dead. So our faith, then, friends, is works in action. It is the physical embodiment of who and what we believe. We are spiritual creatures within the physical. So today, we are focusing upon physical renewal. Physical renewal needed within the Christian walk. Here at Calvary, we give space for people to submit prayer requests either through uh, the website or they can call in to the office and we receive those prayer requests. If you haven't taken advantage of this, I strongly encourage you to do so. About 85% of our prayer concerns that we receive are in relation to people's physical bodies, their physical health. As a staff, we take time each week to lift up those prayer requests, and it's a great honor and privilege to do so. I say all this to emphasize that the need for physical renewal is great, that God seeks and wants us to live lives that are healed, renewed mind, body, and spirit. In fact, there is no doubt that Jesus was and is interested in the physical healing and renewal of people. Throughout his earthly ministry, Christ often performed physical miracles of healing. He healed the official son at Capernaum in Galilee. He delivered Peter's mother-in-law from fever and ailment. He cleansed many from leprosy. 
Even on the Sabbath, he restored a man's withered hand. Jesus gave sight, sound, and voice to the blind, deaf, and mute. In the garden on the night in which he was arrested, he healed the servant's severed ear that Peter struck off. He gave back the paralytic his ability to walk as we read a few moments ago. You see, my God was a healing God. He was a physically healing God. These miracles not only displayed the Son's power, but demonstrated his care towards the physical needs of others. This care for the physical proves that we, too, should take note and care for ourselves physically. The parable read this morning begins with the paralyzed man's friends finding a way to get him in front of Jesus, to get him where Jesus was teaching in Simon's home. Blocked by the crowds, they decide to take drastic measures and they climb onto the roof of the house. In this area, during this time period, roofs would have been constructed by getting tree limbs and branches and putting mud and clay. So as they went up to the roof, they begin, I imagine, to literally unroof the roof. Presumably pulling the tree branches and all of the connecting mud and straw off, cutting through. The people below would have been showered in a downpour of dirt and debris and As the man is being lowered, I'm sure it interrupted Jesus' teaching. How would you feel if someone today were lowered in the middle of the roof to the sanctuary? And so everyone was watching. People were shocked. And as the man lowered down into the home, Jesus didn't stop the man or ask the friends what they were doing or question what he wanted No. Jesus simply pronounces, son, your sins are forgiven. I think this is a rather surprising thing for Jesus today to say at this point in time, in this location at Capernaum. We, as readers of this story, as interpreters of this story, expect that the paralytic is looking for physical healing. But the text is not quite so clear. We think that he's there for physical healing, right? Not for the forgiveness of his sins. Yet Jesus has pronounced the forgiveness of this man's sins. This is the first time Jesus has done this in Capernaum. He had been there before doing miracles and casting out demons, and so this was something new. Secondly, if this man was looking for his sins to be forgiven, one would expect that he would be going to the temple, going to the temple to present a sin offering. The assurance of forgiveness could be given through the high priest after a ritual sacrifice had been performed for the person. And so for Jesus to say, son, your sins are forgiven, when he is not in the temple, not the high priest, and there has been no sacrifice made, makes a clearly scandalous statement to say. This is why the scribes who are present there begin to question within themselves, why does this man speak such? Why does this man forgive the sin only God can? Jesus then asks them which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or rise, take up your bed and walk. On the one hand, since only God can forgive sins, why did Jesus then first forgive the man's sins? Jesus asks them which is easier. Rise up, take up your bed, or forgive the sins. It would make sense then that rise up and take your bed and walk would be more difficult because you see the forgiveness of sins is not something that these people could visually see. Being paralyzed and being healed of a paralyzing disease is immediately verifiable. You either get up and walk or you don't. 
Anybody can go around and say your sins are forgiven because there's no hard data to prove it or disprove it. So Jesus appears to be arguing from the greater to the lesser. If I can do the thing that can be empirically verified, then that serves as proof of my authority to do the thing that cannot be seen. You see, Jesus used the healing of this paralytic man as the physical demonstration of his care for the inward restoration of his heart. The inward restoration of his heart and the embodied walking example of his authority as the son of God incarnate. He used this healing of his sins first to show the need of his physical healing. This week I read a story about this young girl named Joni. She was a young, healthy athlete. She had just graduated from high school and she was voted best athlete of her class. She was an award-winning swimmer and a very skilled tennis player. She was planning on pursuing a future career as a professional athlete. A month after graduation, she was out celebrating with her friends, and while swimming in the Chesapeake Bay, Joni dove and hit shallow water. And as she hit the shallow water, her head made contact with rock. Her head was cracked and her arms and legs immediately went limp. She had to be rescued from the water. This accident so badly damaged her spine that she lost all ability to use her legs and partial movement in her arms. Joni's family were Christians, but she wrote in her story that she really didn't define herself as a Christian. Christ didn't really speak to her life. After the accident, Joni slipped into a deep, dark depression, feeling alone, angry that all her dreams, hopes, and desires had just gone out the window. Those hours and hours of practice and swim lessons and tennis coaches all went goodbye. Physically unable to get up and walk, she noted that one day she turned to a Bible that her mom had left on her bedside table. She picked it up and started searching for answers as to why this happened to her. It was in this searching where Joni came across the story of Jesus healing the paralytic man. And in this discovery, she came to a personal understanding that Christ cared for her plight too. That God wanted to restore her heart, mind, and perhaps one day even her body. She had a renewed sense of being that helped pull her out of the darkness. After she regained total mobility in her arms, she started aggressively working to see if other athletes had been into similar accidents. She wanted to share the hope and renewal that she had found. And though still unable to walk, she started a monthly support group called Physically Stronger for God, where she continues to share her story and the story of the paralytic man. Friends, we too are offered health and healing through our relationship with Jesus Christ. Though we are aware that complete physical healing may not occur during this time, we are assured that God has a plan for our lives. And that one day, when we are together with the Almighty, we will be in perfect physical form, free from aches and pains, worshiping God around the throne. Speaking on behalf of God, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah <coughs> reminded the children of Israel, I will bring you health and healing. I will heal my people and let them enjoy abundant peace and security. You see, whenever or whatever physical state we find ourselves this morning, friends, know that our physical bodily existence matters to God. Paying attention to our bodies and caring for our physical existence is indeed a way to honor God. It's a way to be obedient towards God's commandments, and it's a means of renewal for us on this faith journey. The word tells us in Genesis 1, 27, that we are made in the Majo Dei, made in the image of God, 
We know God is triune, three persons in one, and so God has created each one of us, the spirit, soul, mind, and body. God has imbued a dignity with each one of us as God's creation. The psalmist notes in chapter 139, I have been fearfully, wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. So this morning, I want to remind us, first of all, that we have indeed been fearfully, wonderfully made. That our human bodies are not the design of the universe's just happenstance, but that they are the design of the universe's master builder, master artist, master creator who is holy God, God's self. We are not the product of some random existence, but are indeed designed to reflect the creator. Let's just take a moment and think about how miraculously we have been formed, even while we are yet in our mother's womb. Consider now all the activity going on inside your body as you sit here in the pew or on your sofa or at your kitchen table if you're watching online. Your hearts are pumping, pumping, sending blood through miles and miles of blood vessels, bringing oxygen transporting food material to every part of your body and carrying away the waste. Your lungs are breathing in and out, providing you with a constant supply of air and exhaling away carbon dioxide. Your stomach, perhaps, it's grumbling, and intestines are digesting what you ate for breakfast, giving you those nutrients and energy. Your bones and muscles are enabling you to sit your ears are sensing sound vibrations in the air and converting them to signals to be sent to your brain through your auditory nerve. So that you are able to hear my voice right now, your eyes are taking in the light that is reflecting off of me and the objects around me, light that's stimulating your optic nerve to carry impulses to your brain. Perhaps some of your taste buds are tingling and you are reminded on your tongue of the coffee you drank before coming to worship or the candy or mint you just popped into your mouth. The olfactory nerves in your nose may be picking up the scent of the person shampoo next to you or the perfume that you wore. Touch receptors in your skin, tendons and joints enable you to feel the seat below you. And your brain is coordinating all these things at once without you ever having to think about it. At the same time, you're thinking, thinking about the sermon, thinking about the text, perhaps thinking about something completely different, like what you're going to eat for lunch this afternoon. In any case, your brain is offering a running commentary, all of this information processing simultaneously. We also, as God's unique creations, have the capacity to engage in abstract thinking, moral reasoning, to appreciate beauty, to manipulate our environment more than any other species on the planet. Human beings, my friends, are incredible, complex creatures. Regardless if you see yourself from a biblical point of view or a biological point of view, know that we are physically designed in an amazing manner. Indeed, we are wonderfully made. It's clear then to us that the physical side of us as humans is as important to God as the spiritual. As such, my second reminder this morning is that it is imperative, imperative for us as Christians to take care of our physical being. What does that mean for you then? As creations of the Almighty, we have this responsibility to care for our physical health. Being physically healthy is what empowers us to do the work God has called us to do. In fact, as children of God, our body is a vessel of the Spirit on earth. Paul's letter to the Corinthians states, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We give glory to the Lord when we choose to care for our physical well-being. 
When we make the choice of clean eating or when we partake in a physical activity like taking a walk in God's creation or when we choose things that nourish rather than hinder our ability to live healthy and full lives. It enables us an opportunity to renew our relationship with our creator. Renewal physically. If we are to offer then our bodies as a holy, living sacrifice, as noted in our Romans text this morning, then we must present bodies that have been transformed and renewed, not just in spirit, but in completeness. United Methodist pastor and author Mike Slaughter writes in his book, Momentum for Life, one that I highly recommend anyone reading. He writes, it is tempting for us to disassociate the selection of foods or the decision to exercise from our commitments to God. But our bodies are no longer own. We cannot disassociate them. In addition to Pastor Mike's statement, I would add, since we have been spiritually bought through Christ's sacrifice, we are to physically honor God through every choice we make with our bodies. In so doing, we are invited as another way to connect more deeply with God through caring for ourselves. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 tells us, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to God's glory, to God be the glory. That includes paying attention to the physical needs of ourselves, getting enough rest, Drinking enough water, taking your vitamins, engaging in healthy habits. We're only given one body in this life. We shouldn't be abusing it, neglecting it, taking it for granted. We, as the church, we know are part of God's body. And so the Bible tells us when one suffers, we all suffer. That's true for us individually when we forget to feed ourselves or nourish ourselves, everything will suffer. If we only focus on the spiritual renewal and not include the physical renewal, we rob ourselves of a great joy, of balanced living, of living life to the full that God wants us so greatly to do. As I was preparing for this sermon in studying, I was convicted. I confess that my own efforts of physical exercise are more sporadic than I would like. And oftentimes when my list of to-dos gets long and papers need to be written and sermons need to be compiled, exercise and making the healthy choice is the first thing that I cross off my list. In fact, when I don't get enough rest, I can also be salty towards my loved ones. I'm not as patient as I should be. Perhaps you are similar in this regard. What about overextending ourselves? I know the irony of telling you not to volunteer for something, but when we overextend ourselves to the point where we're not functioning to our best capacity, is that living godly lifestyle? When we push ourselves to exhaustion, we are not acting in the Magio Dei, the image of God. In the Lord of the Rings, Bilbo Baggin tells Gandalf, the wise wizard, I'm old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I'm beginning to feel it in my heart of hearts, well preserved indeed. Why? I feel all thin, sort of stretched out, if you know what I mean. Like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a physical change. Perhaps this morning you feel like bread, and the butter just too thinly spread out on it. I encourage you, if that's you, take rest. Physical rest repairs and rebuilds the body as much as spiritual rest. 
I'm not suggesting that you forgo coming to Sunday morning worship. I'm suggesting that in the week you make choices that allow you to be rested, renewed, restored, so that you can worship the Almighty, mind, soul, and body. I'm encouraging all of us this morning to be renewed in that hope, the hope that Christ not only heals our hearts, but that he restores us physically. Physically so that we can be an engaged people. And so I close this morning by saying, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Friends, be renewed in your rest, be renewed in your exercise, be renewed in the care of the Holy Spirit's temple, your body, and choose that which is good and pleasing to God. Amen.